One of the unresolved debates about World War II is whether or not the Catholic Church was complicit in Nazi Germany's persecution of the Jews, because although the Church knew what was going on, it sat back and did nothing. Critics of the Pope at the time, Pius XII, accuse him of a weakness for dictatorships, looking up to Mussolini, for example, and a distaste for Jews, highlighting his decision to remain silent as six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. They say that Hitler and Mussolini found him all too easy to intimidate, and he embraced real politic over principle. But defenders of Pope Pius XI say that he was a man of great virtue. He was threatened with kidnapping, if not assassination, and he stood up to the Nazis and their Italian fascist allies. He worked tirelessly and effectively to save Europe's Jews, and more would have died if not for him. Well, this debate was speculation for many years because the Vatican's archives during World War II were closed. However, Pope Francis recently opened them, and today's guest, David Kurtzer, took immediate advantage of this. He began researching in 2020, and he wrote the book The Pope at War. Today, we're here to discuss many previously unknown facts about what happened during World War II and whether or not Pope Pius XII was indirectly complicit for all the sufferings that Europe's Jews faced. We look at the constant pressure Pius XII was under from the first days of the war to denounce Nazi atrocities, secret negotiations that he had with Hitler in the late 1930s, and how the Pope reacted when he received firsthand reports of the extermination of Europe's Jews in 1942. So this episode could ruffle some feathers, but it's an important examination of a very difficult time in history. And I think it answers many questions about the Vatican and what it did or didn't do during World War II. I hope you enjoy this discussion with David Kurtzer. For decades, the question of what Pope Pius XII did or didn't do during World War II was something of a mystery because the Vatican archives for this period in question were closed. Historians had to look at a locked door and try to imagine what was inside. You wrote a book about Pius and Mussolini, and you did your best, but were limited by the sources you had access to. Well, those days are over. Can you tell me about the state of scholarship before the Vatican archives were opened, what historians think Pius did or didn't do during wartime? And when you were finally able, you got word that you were able to access the archives, what did you think you would find there? And what were you surprised by what you actually found there? Okay, that's a, a lot of uh, questions <laughs> to answer at once, but let me do my best. The uh, There's been great controversy over Pius XII, the Pope, during World War II and what he did and didn't do. This became a big public issue. I think back in 1963, there was a play by a German playwright, Ralf Hachus, called The Deputy, a play that, by the way, was banned in Italy and so not performed there, but performed in much of the rest of the, at least, Western world. And it portrayed a pope who, although uh, urged to do so by other prelates, refused to condemn the Nazis, the war, or their uh, attempt to exterminate the Jews of Europe. Then in 1999, there was a bestseller book by John Cornwell called the Hitler's Pope, rather provocative title, which more or less charged the same thing about the silence of the pope and his uh, cowardice and his essentially being a, a stooge of Hitler, but he in kind of extreme terms. At the same time, there have been many defenders of, of the Pope who said, in fact, he was courageous. In fact, there have been attempts for many decades now to make Pius XII a saint, which is still an ongoing effort in the church. So there's been this, this great controversy. As you mentioned, the archives for Pius XII haven't been open. There have been demands or requests for decades to open them, to allow us to understand what actually did happen during the war and why he acted the way he did, what exactly he did do. It was all, it took Pope Francis in 2019 to announce that a year hence, in March 2020, those archives would finally be open. That was very exciting for historians who are interested in this history. But that said, there are many other archives that shed light on this history. And I've worked in the archives, the Italian state archives, the fascist regime archives, Mussolini had spies in the Vatican, those archives, the German diplomatic archives, the French archives, the British archives, the American archives. All these countries had ambassadors or envoys to the Holy See who basically were sending in virtually daily reports throughout World War II of their conversations with the people around the Pope as well as with the Pope himself. So it's not as if we didn't know anything. We knew quite a lot, but still there was this missing piece, particularly in understanding what conversations were going on behind the scenes between the Pope's advisors and between those advisors and the Pope. 
And this is what we now have access to for the last two years and what my new book really makes use of, I think, for the first time. In terms of you know, what I thought I'd find, I guess what I was looking for primarily was what kind of advice the Pope was getting behind the scenes and what were those internal discussions going on in the Vatican? Because what the Vatican actually did, for the most part, was known. What wasn't known is what kinds of advice the Pope was getting and to what extent he was indecisive, to what extent he took the part of one group versus another group in the Vatican. And those are all things that now we understand much better as a result of these openings. In terms of surprises, I guess uh, there are a number of surprises in these newly opened archives that I uh, try to detail in, in the book. And for example, the fact that within weeks of Eugenio Pacelli's election as Pope, taking the name Pius XII, in the spring of 1939, Hitler saw an opportunity with the new Pope. He had been having a kind of rough time with the papal predecessor, Pius XI, who had been increasingly critical of the Nazis and increasingly critical of Mussolini's embrace of the Nazis, and saw with Pius XII an ability to end that kind of criticism and bring about some kind of modus vivendi with the Vatican. And so we now know that he sent his an emissary, who himself was a very colorful a figure, perhaps we can talk about later, and they began, he, this emissary began to shuttle between Hitler and the Pope over the next two years and involved in these negotiations, the kind of amazing thing for a historian in the archives in terms of surprising findings is that a basically a transcript was being kept secretly by the Pope. He apparently hid a German prelate in an adjoining room during his conversations with Hitler's envoy and recorded in German because they held these conversations in German, the, uh, the whole conversation. So this is kind of a gold mine for a historian. But there are many other uh, surprises as well, which perhaps we can talk about in our conversation. We'll definitely get to those. And first, I want to do a bit of table setting before Pius XII uh, assumes the papacy. I don't want to excuse any of his actions, but I do want to understand them, that it wasn't simple to fight the Axis alliance since his predecessor had put Italy on a course for that for decades. Pius XI helped Mussolini solidify his dictatorship. He had placed the Italian Catholic Church in the Axis camp without realizing it. But you open your book with a scene in which Hitler visits Italy in 1938. Pius XI is alarmed by him, his anti-Semitism. He is planning to issue an encyclical against him. Can you describe what course Pius XI puts Italy on that Pius XII is dealing with when he assumes the papacy? Yes. In fact, I wrote an earlier book called The Pope of Mussolini about Pius XII, who becomes Pope the same year as Mussolini becomes head of Italy in 1922 and then dies in early 1939. So those years from 22 to 39, when, the, uh, when Mussolini solidifies his dictatorship. And although Mussolini didn't have a religious bone in his body, and in fact, began his career as a left-wing socialist and anti-cleric, all of which the Pope was well aware of. The Pope saw an opportunity with Mussolini to come to a understanding, to reach a deal. There had been, Italy was founded not all that long, just several decades earlier in the 19th century, basically in a war with the Vatican. There had been the Papal States, which had taken up a central swath of the Italian peninsula. And it was only by the Italian army knocking down the wall to Rome in 1870 and seizing the capital that modern Italian state was created. At that point, the Pope at the time, Pius IX, excommunicated the leaders of the new Italian state. So there was one of the characteristics of Italy had been separation of church and state. Mussolini, who needed the backing of the Vatican, backing of the, Vatican, of the Catholic Church to come to power and then solidify his power, basically was willing to promise to end that separation of church and state and give the church all sorts of advantages if the Vatican and the church would support his regime, which they did. This led in 1929, among other things, to the establishment of Vatican City, which had not previously existed as a sovereign entity, and uh, the so-called Lateran Accords, which gave the Catholic Church a position of great privilege in the Italian state. So the Pope Pius XI had reached this mutually beneficial deal with the fascist dictatorship, 
But by the uh, mid-1930s and later 30s, the Pope began to have second thoughts because uh, although he had this close relationship with the fascist regime, he had a very different view of Hitler and Nazism, which he saw as uh, pagan and also saw as attempting to weaken the church's authority in Germany. And so by as he got older and frailer, now we're talking the late 30s, he decided that he needed to take some kind of action, that is the Pope, and he called on a, an American prelate known for his anti-racial um, activities in the United States, dealing with African Americans and prejudice against African Americans. He called on this uh, American Jesuit to draft an encyclical denouncing racism and anti-Semitism. At the same time, this now we're getting into the early 1939, they were coming upon a, a big celebration that was going to bring all the bishops of Italy together with the foreign correspondents in, in Rome. And uh, this was going to take place on February 11, 1939. The Pope was planning an address. Mussolini learns from his spies that the Pope is planning to denounce his alliance with Hitler and perhaps denounce fascism itself. The Pope fortuitously, some say suspiciously, dies the day before he's to give that speech. And then this new man, man who had been number two to the Pope, Eugenio Pacelli, had been his Secretary of State, Cardinal Secretary of State. He is elected to replace him, and he essentially destroys the copies that had been made of the uh, Pope's planned speech, and also buries the draft of the encyclical against racism and anti-Semitism <laughs> that the Pope had planned. So that's basically the what's leading up to the papacy of Pius XII. How would you make sense of the course that Pius XII is trying to chart during World War II? Because on the one hand, he represents the universal Catholic Church with the faithful on both the allied and Axis side of battle lines. On the other hand, he has a special role of leadership within the Italian Catholic Church. Italy's Catholic clergy is urging all good Catholics to fight on the Axis side, despite their unease with the Nazi regime. Mussolini depends on the Pope to ensure church support for the war, but Pius has his own reasons for wanting to remain in Mussolini's good graces. What sort of course do you think he is trying to chart during the war to make sense of the things that he does that we'll talk about later? Well, one thing that's important to keep in mind is in the early years of the war, the Pope has good reason to believe that Hitler and his pal uh, Mussolini are going to win the war. I mean, particularly with the spring of 1940, if you think of just how dramatic this was when Hitler sends his armies westward uh, across the Netherlands, Belgium, and then through France, occupies all those countries within about a month while driving the British in humiliating retreat from Dunkirk from the continent, having the previous year dispatched Poland in a matter of weeks, having uh, previously gobbled up uh, Czechoslovakia and Austria, it, uh, the Pope had good reason to believe he was going to have to uh, deal with the Europe under Hitler's control. And by the way, this is one reason he was eager to maintain very good relations with Mussolini, because he saw Mussolini as his ally and intercessor with Hitler and trying to convince Hitler to go easy on the church. So this is, uh, in the early years of the war, certainly a major motivation for the Pope's decision not to criticize the Nazis even as the uh, attempt to exterminate Europe's Jews uh, it gets underway. Later on, when the course of the war changes after the U.S. gets involved, and so and then the tide turns in, in the Soviet Union as well with Stalingrad in late 1942, early 43. now the Pope has some somewhat different concerns. One of the reasons he hasn't wanted to denounce the Nazis is, you know, who were the Nazis? Who, were, who was the uh, German army? Who was it who was massacring all the Jews of Europe? Uh, about half of them were Catholics, people who thought they were good Catholics. And he was afraid he would create a schism in the church if he denounced uh, the Nazis and what they were doing. And now, as the Germans, as the Axis seemed to be losing the war, he was worried that if he criticized them, he would be blamed by the Germans for their loss and by Catholic Germans for the loss and further risk some kind of split in the church. So these were uh, among the major considerations he had. Well, let's get into what you mentioned earlier, 
the surprises that you found, and in particular at the early stage of the war, when Pius XII is entering into the secret negotiations through uh, Philip von Hessen, how do these begin? And what were some of the parts of the negotiations that surprised you? And what were the two sides trying to achieve? Well, to understand why Hitler would be eager to begin these negotiations, you have to realize that in the last months of Pius XI's life, uh, so now talking about late 38, early 39, the Vatican newspaper, for example, was publishing a series of attacks on the Nazi regime for its persecution of the church in and discrimination against the church in Germany, where uh, church schools were being closed and seminaries were being closed and so on. So Hitler was eager to bring those kind of criticisms to an end. And so he decides to dispatch this quite interesting figure, Philip von Hessen, great grandson of Queen Victoria of England, among others. And he is very close, one of the closest friends of, of Hitler. He's also, curiously, the son-in-law of the Italian king. He's married to the daughter of King Victor Emmanuel III. Uh, Mafalda. And so he also has a residence in, in Rome. So what were, what were they trying to accomplish? Well, thanks to these uh, transcripts, basically, that we now find in the newly opened Vatican archives, we can understand you know, what these conversations were about. So if Hitler was eager to end church and Vatican criticism of his regime, the Pope was eager to end what he saw as persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany by the Nazis. And he would list uh, all sorts of measures that the German government had been taken against the church from his point of view. For example, before the Nazis came to power in Catholic region of Bavaria, most of the children were going to parochial schools, not to state schools. But by this time, almost all those parochial schools had been closed and replaced by state schools, where, of course, Nazi ideology was being promulgated. There had also been threats by Hitler and actions to place hundreds of Roman Catholic clergy, monks, and priests on trial for a variety of sexual crimes and uh, financial crimes. So the Pope had various requests that he was going to make. Interestingly, none of these had to do with Jews or what was going on with the anti-Semitic campaign in uh, Nazi Germany. So this is, this is what was uh, involved in their discussions. Hitler kept promising kind of dangling enticements to the Pope that, yes, he's about to act on his various requests. But in the end, in fact, Hitler does very little. Uh, he ends some of the criticism of the Pope and, and the Vatican in, in the Nazi newspapers, but doesn't do much else. But he does succeed in his goal of keeping the Pope quiet. The sources you refer to indicate that the chief concerns of Pius XII have to do with Catholics or Jewish background Catholics who could fall under the umbrella of persecution, but not necessarily Jews themselves. I suppose we should go to the first reports of firsthand accounts of extermination that Europe's Jews are facing. When is Pius first made aware of these reports and what are his initial responses? Well, uh, Pius XII gets reports very early on from a variety of sources. For one thing, of course, the church has a a capillary network of priests and bishops and archbishops throughout German-occupied Europe, and they're sending in reports to him. Uh, we, he also has early reports from, for example, a Roman priest who is a chaplain with the uh, military, uh, the, the Italian military, and goes back and forth on a hospital train to Poland uh, and to Ukraine and so on. And now we're talking 1941, 42 and brings back to the Pope reports on the attempt to exterminate the Jews there. So he is quite well informed. He has other sources as well. There is a rather dramatic episode in the fall of 42 when President Roosevelt sends his envoy to ask the Pope if he doesn't have some evidence of the Nazi attempts to exterminate Jews in Europe saying that uh, Roosevelt has some evidence of this, is horrified by it, but it would help to have some further verification from Vatican sources, knowing Vatican had such excellent sources around Europe. And what we now know from the newly opened archives is the advice the Pope was getting from his, the man he regarded as his main advisor on Jewish matters, Monsignor Delacqua, who later would become Cardinal Vicar of Rome, 
And uh, Delacqua tells him, it's yes, we have such evidence, but it's best not to share it because he fears that the president, the U.S. president, President Roosevelt, will just use it for what he called uh, propaganda against the Nazis. And so the uh, Pope responds that uh, he has no such evidence that he has any faith in. Right. There seems to be a framing of plausible deniability, both in this matter. Then there's also the other matter that behind the scenes, the Pope is encouraging the Italian church to support Mussolini's war effort, but also ensure deniability of his personal involvement. Can you describe that? And does this seem to reflect also his plausible deniability of firsthand knowledge of persecution of Europe's Jews? Yes, I think that's putting it well. I mean, I think of it as the Pope playing a kind of double game. He, as, as Bishop of Rome, he presides over the Italian clergy, and they are urging, that is not just the clergy, archbishops, bishops, and so on, urging Italians to do their Christian duty by participating in the Axis War. But, for example, the Catholic Action, which is the capillary organization of the laity of Italy, all their directors are urging all good Christians to do their Christian duty and join Mussolini in the war. At the same time, the Vatican is supported financially primarily by American Catholics. And so, uh, aside from other considerations, the Pope is not eager to offend American Catholics. So, he takes this position of neutrality at the same time, and, and we know this from a variety of sources, including uh, diplomatic sources, the Pope is telling the German ambassador of the Holy See, for example, that in his speeches, he's careful not to say anything that would offend either side. And in fact, he carefully places in his speeches passages that either side can use to claim that the Pope supports them. So the Germans and the Italian fascists point to certain of his utterances in his speeches saying this shows that he supports their cause. And the Americans, the allies, of course, uh, want to do the same thing and point to other elements of his speeches to show that the Pope is on their side. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. But first, I want to give a shout out to all the other great shows on the Parthenon Podcast Network, including Beyond the Big Screen. And you can find this and many other great shows at ParthenonPodcast.com. Jewish organizations in the U.S. are raising money in response to the developing Holocaust. They offer funds to the Pope to distribute. And he uses these not primarily to help Jews, but Christians who are subject to persecution because they are of Jewish ancestry. Could you describe what his thought process is in this and how these funds were distributed? Well, you have to realize that you know, the Pope is Roman. The entire curia, the heads of the, the cardinals, the 24 or so cardinals who head the various departments of the central administration of the church are, with only one exception, all Italian the ambassadors or nuncios to these various countries in which the Vatican has diplomatic relations. They're essentially all, virtually all Italian. And in Italy, Mussolini had introduced anti-Semitic so-called racial laws in 1938. So they were in, in effect beginning in 1938. And they are rather draconian. They throw all Jewish children out of public schools. All teachers, Jewish teachers and professors are, are uh, thrown out of the schools as well. Jews are thrown out of the military, out of the civil service. They can't work for banks, can't practice professions, at least with Christians. So the uh, Jews in Italy are in a terrible situation. But the Vatican and the Pope uh, protest only about one aspect of those racial laws, that is, that they're applied to people that the Pope, uh, that the Church regards as, as Christian, that is, the Jewish converts, or, because there had been a rush to the baptismal font by Jews in, in Italy after the racial laws to try to escape their their impact. So this is the background to the Holocaust as well, where the concern that the, it isn't of course the, the case that the Pope is happy about the uh, Nazi attempts to murder the Jews of Europe, certainly he isn't, but he takes it as his responsibility to protect those that the church regards as Catholic. And so when they, you know, getting back to your, your question about money from the U.S., from American Jewish organizations that is sent to the Vatican because the Vatican has this network throughout occupied Europe that might be able to get a relief to people in need, 
largely we find out from the Vatican archives that the emphasis of the church in dealing with these funds is to use them for baptized Jews who are subject to this anti-Semitic persecution, but from the church point of view are regarded as Catholics. How does Pius's diplomatic strategy change after the fall of Mussolini in July 1943? Well, there, there are different phases of this as well, because Mussolini falls at the end of July of 1943, but then September 8th, 9th, 10th is when the uh, Germans come down in, in the wake of the, uh, the fact that Mussolini has been overthrown. They send their troops and occupy most of Italy. The Allies had just landed in, in July in, in Sicily, but are making a kind of slow movement up the peninsula. So Rome is occupied beginning in early September of 43 and would be until June of 44. So now the Pope is, among other things, concerned about protecting the Vatican City with the German occupation and so is eager to establish and maintain good relations with the occupying German military forces. And so, you know, if we're talking about that period, this is what helps, I think, explain some of his more controversial actions or inactions during that period. What are some of those and how would you interpret them based on what you've read in the archives? Well, the do most dramatic would be October 16th, 1943, because that's a kind of black day in the history of, of Italy when the SS attempt to round up all the Jews in Rome to send them basically to death camps. And what happens on October 16th is the uh, Germans, the SS, a few hundred of them, uh, go door to door. They have lists of Jews and where they live in Rome, try to uh, seize all of them. They are uh, sent to a military college uh, right outside Vatican City as a kind of holding area where they're kept for two days while their kind of credentials are checked before they're then sent on to Auschwitz and, and their death. So the Pope is again under great pressure to do something about this. He knew what was the fate, the fate that was going to befall these uh, Jews. The Jews in Rome had long for centuries been considered, uh, they used the term, the Pope's Jews uh, under a kind of papal protection, even as they were for centuries uh, placed in ghettos by the, the Pope. And so he, although under pressure to speak out, to denounce this, or even take more dramatic action, such as uh, block the train from, from leaving, he in the end decides not to make any public protest. And uh, the Jews two days later are taken off. That said, one thing we find out is about 1,260 Jews were seized initially on October 16th, but just about 1,007 or so were placed on the train two days later and sent to Auschwitz. Uh, so the question is, what happened to the other 250? How did they get freed? And it seems that for the most part, those who got freed were those who were able to prove that although they were from Jewish background, they had been baptized, or that they, uh, although Jewish, were men married to Catholic women who had promised to raise their children as Christian. And so the uh, Germans didn't want to offend the Pope, and so uh, release these people. As the momentum of the war shifts, particularly by July 1944, this is after Normandy, when it becomes clear, even to German high commands, the outcome will be. The Pope receives a telegram by the two chief rabbis of Palestine that request a meeting to discuss the ongoing dire situation of Europe's Jews, and he decides not to meet with them. Could you describe this incident? Yes, the, uh, the two uh, chief rabbis, the Ashkenazic and Sephardic uh, chief rabbis in Palestine, write to uh, say, you know, that given the dire situation the Jews are facing in Europe, could they meet with him? And basically, obviously, to seek his help. And again, we now know from the newly opened archives, the kind of discussion going on behind the scene. And in the end, the decision was made that the Pope should not meet with them. This is um, kind of notable, as you indicate, because when it comes, that it comes as the Germans are in full retreat, comes shortly after the Germans have been driven from Rome. But the Germans are still occupying a good part of Italy, and not to mention other parts of Europe. And so the Pope is still not eager to call attention to any role he might play on behalf of the Jews of Europe. I want to uh, get into the 
your assessment of this papacy, because there are a lot of large questions here, and you're in a position to, um, I think, provide one of the most informed, if not the most informed answers to these lingering questions. But before getting into that, could you describe the rest of the war, what Pius did up to the duration of it in Europe, and then for the rest of his papacy up to his death in 1958? Well, certainly one of the uh, dramatic discoveries, I think, in these newly opened archives was in mid-December of 1943. So now we're in um, late, the end of November, Mussolini's regime, because Mussolini got set up a a puppet uh, dictatorship, the so-called Italian uh, Social Republic, based in the south, in Salo, in the north, rather, in Salo, and with the German protection is still controlling most of the Italian peninsula. And November 30th, 1943, they, this uh, Mussolini's government announces that all Jews in Italy should be immediately arrested and sent to concentration camps. Two weeks after this, there's a request made of the Pope to, within, that is from one of his advisors, to speak out, not publicly, but at least to protest to the Italian ambassador in, in a fairly detailed way. It's, it itself is perhaps... Uh, has a certain amount of anti-Semitism in it as well, and that the the claim is made that the Italian racial laws were already doing enough to protect Italians from the evil influence of Jews, and they don't need to be murdered or, or all uh, put in concentration camps. Uh, but the again, the Pope turns to his the man he regards as his main advisor on Jewish affairs, and that man sends him a long memo, which we now have a copy of, thanks to the opening of the archives, which is filled with the uh, most anti-Semitic kind of language and basically tells, uh, advises the Pope not to go ahead with that protest. So this is, this is basically the path uh, followed. Uh, in the last months of the war, there are uh, attempts to in- involve the Pope in negotiating. Now, from the point of view of the Nazis, they're losing the war. People like the German ambassador to the Holy See are looking for a way to save their skins. And they know that the Pope is now very concerned about an allied victory because who are the allies? Well, the Soviet Union is one of the main allies. And the Pope is now in the the, uh, waiting months of the war, fearful that the uh, Red Army is going to march through Europe or march through part of Europe and the rest of Europe may rise up in communist uh, revolt. And so the Pope is very concerned to avoid a complete defeat of the Germans. Not, again, that he's any fan of the Nazi government, which he isn't, but he is worried about a complete collapse of Germany. And so, although there are some attempts to involve the Pope in negotiating a a compromise peace, the Pope quickly realizes, because he's a fairly uh, smart person and uh, is constantly being told by the Allied uh, envoys to the Vatican that the Allies are not going to accept any negotiated peace, they're only going to accept an unconditional surrender. And so in the end, the uh, Pope, although he had sort of dreamed for years of playing the role of peacemaker, is not able to do so. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. What happens afterwards uh, once the war concludes until the end of his papacy? Yes. So he'll uh, remain Pope until his death in 1958. So for another 13 years after the end of the war. And you know, the various elements here, I mean, his becomes very involved in the uh, anti-communist struggle, the years of the Cold War. But in terms of Jewish matters and the, the Holocaust, he still does not, well, does not talk about the Holocaust, does not talk about any, certainly any church responsibility for anti-Semitism that could have made the Holocaust possible the various attempts to end some of the anti-Semitic teachings of the church, for example, in the Good Friday prayer for the perfidious Jews, he resists making any changes to those. All that would have to await his death, where he's replaced by John the 23rd, who very quickly, in fact, turns to these issues. And and the contrast is great that as soon as Angelo Roncalli becomes uh, elected Pope uh, John the 23rd, he uh, quickly turns to these questions of the centuries-long demonization of Jews by the church and begins to put an end to them. 
Well, this gets to the big question, and I imagine you've had some very heated discussions doing uh, warts and all exploration of somebody who is uh, on the road to canonization by the Catholic Church. How would you describe perhaps the best representation of Pope Pius XII? How have his supporters depicted him? How What has been the most vitriolic depiction of him? Hitler's Pope, that book. And you, perhaps the best positioned person to answer this question, where would you place him between these two depictions? Well, he wasn't Hitler's Pope. He was no fan of Hitler or Nazism. He saw uh, the Nazis as persecuting the church in the areas that they they ruled. But, you know, and if his defenders were to limit themselves to say something like, you know, he was facing uh, very difficult, dramatic times. He had to worry that the Nazis were going to come to power in Europe. He had a responsibility for the welfare, institutional uh, welfare of the church. You know, I could understand them taking this position, but they don't. They go well beyond this to describe him as a courageous figure who uh, went to great risk to uh, protect Jews and so forth. And none of this is accurate. So, you know, he was facing a difficult situation and he you know, had the priorities that he had. He also knew Germany very well. He had spent 12 years there as the papal nuncio or papal ambassador to Germany and was fluent in German and quite uh, proud of his ability to uh, meet with Germans, including German soldiers throughout the war as they visited and uh, talk to them in their own language. So, you know, the, the effort to beatify him uh, goes on. I think the other thing that for me is important to realize, it's not so much his silence during the uh, war that uh, I think is the issue for me in terms of church responsibility for the Holocaust. It's the fact that the Nazi regime and especially the, the Italian regime in, in justifying their activities against Jews constantly made reference to what the popes had warned against in terms of Jews for centuries and the popes confining Jews to ghettos, uh, placing yellow stars on their clothes and so on. And the, the failure to recognize that although the uh, Nazi regime, its ideology was far from Christian, that they were able to make use of this centuries-long demonization of Jews to convince their people to treat the Jews as subhuman and ultimately to murder them. Well, I know that different historians uh, have feelings about counterfactual looks at history. Some prefer not to engage in the practice at all. Others, like Harry Turtledove, make an entire career out of writing books like this. You understand well the limitations that Pius XII was under. If it were easy to denounce Hitler, he would have done it. But he is a head of state. So in addition to being the leader of the church, he's also a diplomat. But as much as you feel comfortable doing, what do you think would have been the best course of action for him to do? Understanding, of course, that he can't just simply be an activist because he has all of these other duties as head of the church during World War II. Well, where he really had the greatest influence was in Italy, as I mentioned before. Of course, he was Roman and the, uh, the curia of the mm. church was almost all Italian. Italy, of course, was 99% Roman Catholic. If you think, I, I'd begin with the decision of Italy to enter the war, which came in June 1940. The Italians had no love for Germans. They just fought a war against them not that long earlier in World War I. The German ideology, the Nazi ideology of Aryan supremacy would not have great purchase in, in Italy among Italians. And so how was it that, and Mussolini therefore had to be concerned of how he was going to motivate his people to join Hitler in the war. And had the Pope spoken out strongly against it, and urged his Italian clergy to do so and forbidden them from supporting the war. This, I think, would have had potentially, again, it's counterfactual, conjectural, but I would think this would have had a great impact on Italy and Italy joining the Axis. In terms of Germany, uh, at the time of the enlarged Third Reich, once Austria and Sudetenland were part of it, practically or close to a half of Germans were Roman Catholic. And so if he had, in fact, denounced the attempt to exterminate Europe's Jews, it could have had some impact there. I think it's a little harder to know. I mean, his concern was that would simply lead to the German Catholics, or at least many of them, 
abandoning Rome and setting up their own kind of counter Catholic Church. But, you know, the question is, what are, should the priorities of a pope be? Should they be institutional protection, like, uh, you know, that he's the CEO of a large international organization? Or is he to be a, uh, a moral leader? And I think as the head of an institution, Pius XII could be defended in, for his actions during these, these years, perhaps. But as a moral leader, not so much. If he had come out and vehemently denounced the Third Reich, you show that Mussolini intimidated him with the threat of violence against church activities. What do you think Mussolini would have done if Pius would have issued full-throated denunciations of Nazi Germany? I think Mussolini would have been in trouble, actually. Again, Hitler, I think less so. Hitler <laughs> uh, would have cracked down on the Catholic Church in, further in, in Germany and in the lands that the uh, Germans had occupied. But in Italy, I could be very difficult. I mean, Mussolini had long been able to portray the clergy as uh, supporting him. So to denounce the Catholic Church, I mean, to, it's almost inconceivable in, in Italy for a, an Italian political leader. So I think he would have been in big trouble. Well, your book does a lot to address the question of what the Catholic Church's role was in World War II, and it adds a lot of information about the papacy of Pius XII. In these discussions and many of these debates that are ongoing today, what do you hope that your book does? Well, first of all, you know, I tried to write the book in a way that was going to attract a broad leader, a readership. I mean, I could have written this book for fellow uh, scholars, and although the book does have uh, you know scores of pages of, of notes at the end of the book and so on, the attempt is to write a kind of page turner that people are going to see the drama, and I see this as a highly dramatic uh, kind of history. And so to attract people who aren't already taking strong positions with respect or just don't know enough about this history to take a position with respect to the debates that have swirled around Pius XII and his silence during World War II. So I would hope that those with open minds would uh, see this history for uh, what it is, what I see it as, and see the complexities, see the drama, see the role that personalities play but also see that there were decisions made that had major consequences and have, I think, major implications for today for when religious leaders have a responsibility to speak out on moral issues, transcendent moral issues. I mean, you can see what the slippery slope, the Italians and the church in supporting Mussolini had no idea initially the kind of tragedy that was going to result, the disaster of World War II and their participation in it. But perhaps we can learn some lessons from that about accommodations that are being made today by religious leaders with political leaders who offer them various goodies in exchange for their support, but perhaps at a great cost. Well, these were profoundly difficult times, but it's because of that that I think this makes it such an important story. And I, too, hope that these are lessons that are heated and there is a lot for people to consider with what you wrote. Well, thank you for describing this to us. You've done a great work here with this book. And for listeners who want to read it, the name of it is The Pope at War, The Secret History of Pius XII, Mussolini and Hitler. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. That is all for today. If you'd like to see show notes for this episode and all my other episodes, go to parthenonpodcast.com. That's the name of the podcast network that this show is a part of, along with other great history shows like Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, James Early's Key Battles of American History, and other shows as well. If you'd like to support this show, there are two easy ways to do so. The first is to subscribe to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. The second thing is to join the show's membership program. It's on Patreon, and if you go to patreon.com slash unplugged and join it, as a member, you'll get completely ad-free episodes of the show's entire back catalog, which is 600 episodes and growing, 